I'm going to talk to you about uh, UCLG, uh, United Cities and Local Governments, about the Agenda 21 for Culture, which is the main focus of the Culture Committee of UCLG. And then I'm going to give you very rapidly, too rapidly, unfortunately, some examples from the city that I know best, which is Lille in the north of France, of how you implement an Agenda 21 for Culture. Because Agenda 21 for Culture often seems rather theoretical, and many cities in the world today are implementing Agenda 21 for Culture. So the C UCLG uh, came into being in 2004 in Barcelona, and it was the result of uh, many local governments, many cities of the world, in all five continents, who had the feeling that um, the, the, the governments, especially if you think about it, the UN, were not listening enough to the experience, to the first-hand experience of cities who have to deal every day with the difficulties of the inhabitants, who have to deal with pollution, with climate change, uh, with uh, housing, uh, with education, and that a lot of the decisions were being taken at government levels that never really listened to what people had first-hand knowledge of uh, the difficulties, real difficulties of people, were, in other words, local governments. So this was a sort of big, big, big organization, suddenly, of local governments. And in the last, it's only existed for 10 years. And in the last 10 years, there's been a rise in power of these local governments, of a federation, a world federation of local governments representing all the, all the continents and all kinds of cities, from cities of 20 million inhabitants to cities that have 100,000 or 50,000 all over the world. And the, the, this, this UCLG has different committees, of course, and the Culture Committee, from 2004 on, from the first day on, decided to launch an Agenda 21 for Culture, which was to examine the role of culture in sustainable development, with the idea that since the 60s, when sustainable development uh, came into being and was very much discussed in development, it was always based on three pillars, the economic, the social, and the environmental. And it seemed to many, many people, especially people involved in culture, that there was something missing, something essential that makes a link between uh, social, economic, and environmental, which is the cultural aspect. And if you want to have a society, if you want to live together, you cannot just avoid the issue of culture. And we talked about it a lot this afternoon. And it, what is interesting is that the point of view that I'm going to defend here really is incredibly complementary with what Giselle said this morning about the convention, with what was said this afternoon uh, about the difficulties of, of the uh, convention. Uh, th th that's a UNESCO convention, therefore it has to do with governments. And if you take the point, point of view of the work of cities, there you have a really, really different aspect to things. So it was approved in, in 2004. It has 67 articles and five main issues. Cultural rights. Cultural rights were something that were just being discussed uh, in a very important way. In 2007, uh, there's a declaration of Fribourg uh, of some university people who, who brought out a very important declaration on cultural rights. Uh, sustainability in territory. This is... So cul all, from 2004 on, there was the... UNESCO Convention, the Declaration plus the Convention on uh, Cultural Diversity. 2007, there was the, uh, the Fribourg Cultural Rights Declaration. 2004, Agenda 21 for Culture. So suddenly, another way of seeing culture and seeing its role in society was being developed by many different, uh, from many different angles. Um, and the Agenda 21 for Culture tried to take in some of these aspects uh, on cultural rights, on the fact that 
cultural diversity was essential. And as threatened as biodiversity, 200 languages disappear every day, every year, sorry, every year. That means in 10 years, 2,000, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This was a real threat, and we've talked a lot about hegemony this afternoon uh, uh, with, of culture. And so cultural diversity seen in that, in that sense, in the sense of defending the diversity, uh, was put into the Agenda 21. Sustainability and territory, of course, because it's not cities. If you, take, if you talk about a sustainable city today, not just talking about uh, you know, what, just the inside of the, of the place where it's built. A sustainable city also englobes what is outside it, what feeds it. Uh, in other words, all the rural a aspect, all the rural hinterland behind it. Uh, this is a, a sustainable city. It's not just the walls. Uh, economy, media, cultural industries, they have been discussed. Uh, inclusion and participation, that is essential to any sustainable development way of seeing things. And of course, culture has a role to play in that, a big role. Uh, governance, uh, what is, we know uh, today in, in whether it's governments or whether it's local governments, that uh, culture is culture, education is education, uh, town planning is town planning, health is health. And it's really, really important, and there's been a lot of work done in the cities to open up, uh, to stop this way of thinking, and to, to have a much more transversal, horizontal way of thinking. Agenda 21 for Culture is translated today in 21 languages. It, is, it has about 500 cities, big, middling, and small, uh, in its network. It is the committee which is a world committee, uh, is presided by Lille Metropole. Uh, it has as co-presidents uh, Buenos Aires, the city of Mexico, Montreal, as vice presidents uh, Milano, Barcelona, Angers, and recently Saint Louis du Senegal. Uh, and it has a very strong uh, uh, active uh, body of cities of about 20 cities plus 500 cities in the network. And for the last 10 years, we have been coordinating good practices uh, in that kind of thing, participation, good governance, uh, how to do echo, echo organization, very important. Uh, transparency of uh, how you, of the political, political aspects of cultural governance. Uh, all, the, all these kind of keywords have been collected from different examples all over the world. So we now have a, a very, very uh, important uh, database of good practices. And of course, they are exchanging all the time. That's the whole point of the transversality. Which countries, governments can't do. It's much too difficult. Cities, much more open and fast at exchanging information and less paranoid. Um, the UCLG committee uh, has brought out six important reports. Some of them were uh, commissioned by UNESCO. Uh, I don't have time to really go into that. Uh, okay. In 2010, in uh, Mexico, in the third uh, UCLG World Congress, it was voted unanimously that uh, culture would be the fourth pillar of sustainable development. So this was a really, it, this was after a lot and a lot of uh, lobbying and a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, as I told you before, the idea was that it's out of the question that culture should not be in sustainable development. And in our discussions, uh, many of our friends from the sustainable development world said, Oh, but you don't have to, we don't have to have culture because culture is everywhere. And we always said, yeah, sure, if culture is everywhere, that means culture will be nowhere. So this is why there was a big fight to put culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. Now, some people say, yes, but, you know, governments should be the fifth pillar. And never mind, even if we decided to abolish all the pillars because it didn't make any sense anymore, 
it's really important that culture is seen both as a link between social, economic, and environmental issues and as a subject in itself. So today, for this UCLG, culture is the fourth pillar of sustainable development, economic vitality, social equity, environmental responsibility, cultural vitality. Mexico City has inaugurated uh, just very recently, I'm going next week uh, to be part of the jury uh, to give a prize to the city that has done the most work uh, in cultural and sustainable development, which gives a kind of visibility uh, to, to this, uh, to this I suppose it's becoming a label. But the important thing is that we've had so far, 56 candidacies, which are really interesting because they tell you how a city for the last 10 years, maybe even longer, has been going about changing the way people see culture, the way people they participate in culture. And, okay, there will be one prize, but the important thing is that the 56, uh, the 56 cities will be put... In, uh, to network, and we will look at all their examples and put them together and try and get them to interact on these examples because most of them are really, really interesting. Now, a lot has been said about post-2015, uh, the fact that uh, the UN is now working on a new, uh, a new set of uh, goals for, 20, for 2015, the first set between the year 2000 and the year 2015 was supposed to eradicate poverty. I think we still have a long way to go, so we're starting again, 2015, 2030, and seeing what uh, the shared world goals are. And there's a big, big fight going on right now uh, with all the civil society, the UCLG, all the ONGs, uh, that um, are, are, are defending uh, local governments, local way of th doing things, in a world network. We're going from local to global. And the, uh, the idea is to impose, to make sure that there is a goal in uh, 2015 on sustainable urbanization. Because once again... Uh, the governments are not at all consulting local governments uh, about what they think of the goals, the sustainable development goals, not at all. So, so there's a big, big movement to impose a goal on, sus on sustainable urbanization and inside sustainable urbanization, sustainable culture, the role of culture. Today, we know that more than 50% of the world population live in cities in 30 years, it's 70%. And this is organized via a global task force, uh, which, is, which meets, which has all the, the ONGs, the UCLG, uh, the, the sustainable development ONGs as well, not just cultural, uh, trying to uh, influence uh, the UN decisions and in 2016, there is a, another enormous, very important meeting of the UN on, called Habitat 3, which is going to be on, uh, on housing in the world. And once again, the UN apparently has no intention of asking cities what they've done, or what, what their good experiences, what their bad experiences are, uh, of inviting them to think about housing. And there again, there's a huge movement uh, of local governments uh, to have a say in, this, uh, in the big decisions that will be taken and that will influence our lives. So, I'll go back here. Um, the, uh, the, the culture committee of the UCLG works in two ways. First of all, as a, a coordinator for all the work that's being done in the cities, uh, on the Agenda 21 for Culture. And secondly, 
and a, at a worldwide level of lobbying. Uh, and this morning, uh, uh, Giselle, you mentioned Hang the Hangzhou uh, meeting. Uh, you mentioned other important meetings uh, where we're really trying to impose uh, the, and it seems obvious, but it's not. We don't even know whether we will make it uh, to impose the fact that governments consider uh, the work of cities uh, on sustainable development, on culture, as something important. So now I will give you, because I know this sounds theoretical, so I will give you some examples of how the city of Lille, which got engaged uh, in an Agenda 21 for Culture in 2005, how the city of Lille, I have to, I give you, I have to give you very few examples because we don't have time. What we did to uh, join this movement to, uh, to work on the key words of the Agenda 21 for Culture. First of all, in 2004, we became European capital of culture. Uh, we are a city that uh, was uh, once uh, one of the, the most uh, successful uh, areas of the whole of France a long time ago because we were the mining, the textile, and the siderurgie uh, capital of France. Uh, all this fell apart in the 70s, 80s, and the, the city was, had, had a lot of, uh, of problems, and uh, it was starting to rise again uh, by 2004 when we came, became European capital of culture. And instead of just having a party for one year, which is what many European capitals of culture do, they have many artists, they have a great, great parades, they have a wonderful time, we decided to make it a laboratory, an experimental year, to see how we would put culture at the center of our development, of our future development. So the idea is because I hear lots of talk about institutions and how you're stuck uh, with uh, cultural words and things like that. We decided, okay, we're going to push things. We're going to just push things a bit and try and see things from a different angle. And I just give you a few examples. Uh, sorry, it's in French, but I'll translate it. Um, uh, we chose because in the Agenda 21 of Culture, there are many principles, recommendations. So each city just chooses what suits it geographically, from the population point of view, from its cultural point of view. Uh, you make your choice for you to be able to go ahead. We chose, we, in, in Lille, because, because we were a city which had to have a lot of workforce coming from the outside, there were about 80 languages spoken in Lille. Uh, so obviously, the maintenance of, of our cultural diversity was really important. And the important thing with cultural diversity is not to give directives, it's to recognize it, it's to uh, support it. People know how to express their culture. It's, it's the recognition of the culture, the support of the culture, and also ways to make different cultures interact. It's not to give, uh, say, how it should be done at all. It's to, on the contrary, the idea is to recognize it. Um, so the echo organization that I've talked about, but it would be too long, participation of inhabitants, the transversality of the way we work, very important, access to culture. Access to culture is a never-ending story. There is never an end to it, but you just have to progress. You just have to go on. You just have to transform things little by little. And, of course, governance and how you link up with social, economic, and environmental problems. Um, so in Lille, of course, we had many factories that were completely gone. Uh, so we decided to make many of these factories into cultural uh, places, cultural venues. And that had two advantages, even three. One, it, it kept places of heritage in our city that were important because people had worked there for generations and generations. And this was a way of recognizing that even if it wasn't uh, you know, a Palladian palace, it was a, really a place of importance. It was a place that had a symbolic value. And so we took many factories and we made them into uh, cultural places. 
This is a station, actually, uh, an old um, sorting station. So this was Lille 2004. I won't go into that, although I could speak about it for hours. Uh, a year that was a great, great success. So that helped us a lot because people thought before we did capital, European Capital of Culture, we, in, we organized many, many things. But then we went into the, into the popular neighborhoods and said, why don't you participate in this? And people said, oh, you know, it's not for us. It's going to be the center. It's not going to be for us. And we really, really made an effort to take all the projects, even the tiny projects in, in the most uh, remote neighborhoods and integrate them into this year. Okay, it was superficial, but it gave an incredible amount of uh, pride uh, to people who thought that their city, their, 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 their area was completely finished. Uh, and the fact that they were able to participate, even in small ways, uh, gave a great pride and great success, and mainly uh, success in the eyes of the population, of the inhabitants, which for us was really, really important. That's just a detail, that's just uh, our, our, the vision that France and other places in Europe had of Lille was black and white. The mines, everything went wrong, the textiles, it was all, the city was black, the, the mountains of the mines were black. And so we said, okay, when people come for European Cup that year in 2004, they're going to come to the station and it's going to be pink. Okay? This was a first symbol of how things could change. Okay, and so we, we took 12, 12 factories that had been abandoned and made them into cultural venues. 12, 12 on one territory. That is enormous. And we made them work together. And so this is an old beer factory. Uh, and the idea was very open spaces where you could have an international uh, artist in residence. You could have inhabitants coming for a kitchen, that because there were always kitchens available for the inhabitants, making a meal. Sometimes they even made meal for the artists, but sometimes between themselves. Uh, you could have local uh, associations coming to join uh, the, 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 the international artist theme. So these places are very open, and they are incredibly successful, and they are used by the population, by local artists, and by international artists. That's another one. Uh, where there was a big discussion with the inhabitants about keeping the chimney because the architect didn't want the chimney. And they did, so we kept it. Uh, that's an old uh, postal sorting place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly. Um, and this is the newest thing that's coming out in a few months. And it is a place totally dedicated to urban culture. Uh, Hip-hop, rap, uh, all, all the urban culture. And there was a big discussion with the activists of urban culture in our city uh, to make it a very transparent place because there's all this thing about, you know, the, the urban culture is secret, it's in corners, and in any case, nobody wants to recognize them. And so the, the result of a big discussion was to do something that was really open, transparent, uh, and this is going to open very soon. It's the only place in France that is so big and completely dedicated to urban culture. And of course, all around, there are places in the streets. Don't forget one thing, you live in Brazil, but so everything you do and the outside space, we have to do inside, uh, because it's minus something degrees six months of the year. So the, 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 the discussion on space is different for you than for us, because for us, it's inside, not very much outside. Uh, oh, well, I'm not going to give all the examples because I don't have time, but you will see by, by the pictures the examples of things that we have done with children. We've got a huge program on educating children with music, reading, visual arts, theater, and that happens inside the schools. So it's a, it, it takes too long to explain, but it's, it's, a, really very, uh, it's a very innovative program. Our kids, they learn to play music in schools without any, any sight reading. No reading of music. Because in France, you have to do two years of reading music before you touch an instrument. And that's a disaster. 
visual arts, it's about new, new technology. It's not about learning to draw. Uh, that's participative. Uh, we got all the, but I'm not going to talk to you about that because we're in Brazil and you know all about participative parades. At the opera, there are days, open days. Everybody comes. It's totally free and there are small forms everywhere in the opera. In the, in the, in the staircases, uh, in, the, uh, in the loge of the artists, everywhere. And it's free and there are thousands and thousands of people who come all weekend uh, to participate, to see, and, and the forms are, are usually a very, very, very high standard, but very accessible. One year after 2004, we decided that every three years we would have a new mini European Capital of Culture, mini 2004. We called it Lille 3000. It's a joke because that means we have 3,000 years to do culture. And... Um, we, every year, every three years, we say it's a theme. One, the first time we did it, it was India. And so we asked Bollywood, Bollywood uh, specialists who do the, who do the posters, uh, we asked them to uh, take photographs of people in our neighborhoods that were chosen. We have 10 neighborhoods in Lille. And each neighborhood chose four or five people that they thought were very representative of their neighborhood. It was the butcher, it was the, the professor of, uh, of uh, judo, uh, it was uh, somebody who works in... It, they chose, they chose. And we sent the photographs of the t you know, 50 people, 10 times five, to, to Bollywood. Uh, from the photographs, they invented Bollywood posters, okay, and uh, they were huge, huge posters that we put all over the areas, all over the back to the neighborhoods, and it was just incredible for the people to see themselves like that, as you can imagine. And then at one moment, we invited the Bollywood artists to come and meet the people that they had painted like that. So you can imagine that the encounters were incredible, and then we had, and they did. Uh, they did workshops uh, on how they paint Bollywood uh, affiche and all that. So it's just to show you that, you know, we try and invent new ways of making people participate in uh, cultural events. Uh, that's, w that's one where we have sport and culture. It's an association that, that combines sport and culture in a very Im interesting way. And... Every year on the 1st of May, there's an association that organizes La Fête de la Soupe. Now, soup is the most universal food that you can have. You have it everywhere in the world. And everybody, wherever you come from, your grandmother made this kind of soup or that kind of soup, if it's from Cambodia, if it's from Algeria. So everybody comes out and makes their soup, soup of their gra where, where they came from. And, and there's a jury that tastes all the soup. And at the same time, we have, a, a, we, have a, we have world uh, artists coming uh, in the middle of the people who are having the soup. So this is a moment that is very, very expected by the people of Lille. And uh, it's, it's, from the intercultural point of view, it's incredible because it means that it's really the people who bring out, make their soup and make everyone else taste it. I'm nearly there. I'm not going to go that. Um, just quickly, I organize... Uh, I used to be, uh, sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor for Culture of Lille for 13 years. I stopped one month ago. Um, every month or every six weeks, I organize Petit Déjeuner Culture. I'm sure everyone knows what that means. Um, with all the cultural actors, big, small, tiny, uh, all meet together. By, uh, and we talk uh, about uh, anything, everything, the budget difficult thing to talk about because if you have the opera representative and the representative of a small uh, uh, orchestra, uh, the, the discussion can be difficult. But that's been going on for six years now and uh, it's incredible the way people have started to relate, to work together, to get to know each other uh, and to get to know the town, the uh, municipality as well much better. That's my conclusion. I love this conclusion. It's, it's a, a Polish, it's a Polish um, director, theater director, who said, culture is like love. It's useless. <laughs>